So good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Ludger Hagedon, and it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, for tonight's uh, book presentation. Um, it is a very special event uh, for the Institute, uh, an event that is dedicated to Ernst Wolfgang Birkenfurter, uh, a man whom the Institute knows a lot of gratitude to, and a man who is closely linked with the intellectual history um, of this place. Uh, let me welcome all of you uh, on behalf of the Institute and on behalf of our rector, Charlene Ranberry. I was just asked about, about her. Unfortunately, she cannot be with us uh, tonight, so I give her greetings to all of you. So welcome for this uh, night um, and for the presentation of the book of uh, um, Birkenfurter's writing on constitutional and political theory. As already stated, uh, Ernst Wolfgang Birkenfurter is closely related to this institute, and I will say about a few words about that in a minute. But just let me st uh, start by saying something else. This evening is an opportunity, a great opportunity, to find out uh, that the political and constitutional theory of Ernst Wolfgang Birkenfurter is actually much more than the one sentence that is always related to him. The famous uh, Birkenfurter dilemma, the Birkenfurter dictum, uh, as it is said in German, or the Birkenfurter paradoxon. Uh, it is a sentence that was published in an article, if I'm not misled, exactly 50 years ago from today, from, from this year. Um, and when it came out under a very unspectacular uh, title, in a little article, I don't think that everybody thought at that time that this would turn out to be one of the sentences or maybe even the sentence that is most often quoted uh, in German political theory of post-war times. <laughs> the liberal, um, secularized state um, lives by prerequisites which it cannot guarantee itself. This is the English wording of the sentence uh, by Birkenfurter, the famous sentence. And as already said, it is quoted in so many political speeches at so many occasions, at so many festivities, and it is always referred to as the one sentence saying that uh, the liberal state, uh, the secular state, needs something from outside, that it needs to import moral resources, or let's say moral raw material from outside, that it cannot produce by itself this moral raw mm -hmm. material. And where does the moral raw material come from? from religion or religion, obviously. So far, so good or so bad, who knows? This <laughs> is one part of the story, but most often this is the only aspect of this article that is quoted. But even Birkenfurter himself on several occasions made clear that the main intention of writing this article was a very different one, namely to convince his fellow citizens and one might also say his fellow believers uh, that's one could even say the Catholic believers, his fellow Catholic believers, to take the adventure, to take the risk of the modern democratic state. And this is often forgotten, and most often also the, seconds, the second sentence that follows this one famous sentence is not quoted. Mm -hmm. Das ist das große Wagnis, das der Staat um der Freiheit willen eingegangen ist. So the, the, the great adventure that the state has taken for the sake of freedom. The, second, the sentence following immediately after this one sentence. And it was our colleague Jan Werner Müller, we have already mentioned his name as well, who was here at the Institute until this summer as a visiting fellow, who referred ex especially to these two sentences and emphasizing the importance of the second sentence in an article for Neue Zürcher Zeitung just um, two or three months ago in mm -hmm. one of the most recent publications of this. So, so far so good. Let me say a few words. I said uh, he's, Birkenfurt is closely related to this place. Um, he was uh, deputy chair in the Academic Advisory Institute of the IWN for many, many years. And he was a regular guest and participant in what the o Institute organized in the uh, uh, papal residency, summer residency at Castel Gandolfo, the famous Castel Gandolfo talks of the IWM that took place between 1983 and 1980, uh, 98. 
So over the course of 15 years, altogether it was eight meetings by very um, famous, uh, um, well-known, distinguished guests. Um, Birkenförde, I tried to find that out before our meeting today, Birkenförde took, uh, took part in seven out of these um, eight meetings. And just to give you an idea, this Bild von Menschen in der Perspektive der heutigen Rechtsordnung, um, die Krise in der Rechtsordnung, der Ausnahmezustand, or die sozialen und politischen Ordnungsideen der französischen Revolution. These were some of the to topics that he addressed. <coughs> and to finish up, um, also Birkenförde was one of the very first to carry out a research project <coughs> here at the Institute, already in the early or mid uh, 1980s, under the title of Human Rights in Christian the Theological and Secular Understanding. It was a project that he carried out together with uh, Robert Spähmann at that time. Mm -hmm. And since we celebrate the 35th anniversary of the IWM, just in three weeks from now, you know that this, this place was founded in 82, so it was really one of the very first initiatives uh, that was run by, by Birkenford at that mm -hmm. time. And it is a long time in between, more than 20 years, that in a letter from 2007, December 2007, the former rector of this place, Michalski, Krzysztof Michalski, wrote uh, um, a letter to Birkenförde stating his gratefulness for all of what, what, uh, what Ernst Wolfgang Birkenförde had done for the Institute. And I will quote these two or three uh, sentences at the end. It is in German, I guess most of you will understand. It's a letter of gratitude. Sie waren doch für uns als Vorsitzender des Beirats, aber auch sonst, eine ungemein wichtige Stütze. Ihr Rat und Ihre Hilfestellung waren für uns, für mich persönlich, von enormer Bedeutung, insbesondere in Krisenzeiten. Sie haben uns so oft geholfen, das Richtige zu finden, wenn es darauf ankam. Wenn es darauf ankam, kommt. When it really matters. This, I think, is also a very good word for opening uh, the de debate of uh, tonight on Birkenförde's constitutional and political theory. And I will now hand over to Thiel Stein, who will introduce um, the participants on the podium. And I will just end by saying one uh, sentence that refers to the very end of our event tonight. And afterwards, all of you are invited downstairs to our cafeteria for a glass of wine and for cheese and invited to continue uh, our discussion downstairs. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm really moved by the words you just quoted from this letter. <laughs> so Miriam Kunkler and I, my name is Tine Stein. I'm a professor for polit political theory at Kiel University. Miriam, as uh, my uh, dear colleague, is a professor at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Bonn. We too warmly welcome you all to this event <laughs> to present the new English edition <laughs> of Ernst Wolfgang Birkenförde's Constitutional and Political Theory here at the Institute in this Books in Perspective series. We are very, very excited that the Institute has agreed upon the idea to present the book here because as we just <coughs> has, have heard, Birkenförde has an intellectual relationship with the Institute. And um, I would like to add just one more finding, what we found out about the history here. As many of you know, uh, Michalski had edited the Castel Gandolfo series which documents the lectures and discussions of the yearly Castel Gandolfo summer conferences. And in the <laughs> 1993 volume of this series, titled Die Liberale Gesellschaft, one can find an article of Ralf Dahrendorf. Mm -hmm. The title of this article was Freiheit and Soziale Bindung, Freedom and Social Cohesion. And to our knowledge, it is here that Birkenförde's famous sentence on the presuppositions of the liberal and secularized state, which it itself cannot guarantee, was characterized for the first time, not as a dictum, not as a dilemma, but as a paradox. And we think that from that time on, mm -hmm. usually it was referred to as a paradox. So it was Darendorf in one of your uh, book series who has coined this as a Birkenförde paradox. So we are delighted that the Institute gives us the opportunity to present today Birkenförde's 
work, all the more Klaus Offer and Alexander Zomek will do so and share with us their perspectives on the work of Birkenfeld's constitutional and uh, political thought. Alexander Zomek is a professor of law here at the University of Vienna, specialized in European law and, um, if I may say, in political theory as well, with a focus on cosmopolitanism. We know, Miriam and I know, that he's very much interested in the question in how far Birkenfeld's work can provide, at least in part, the basis for a European public law. Mm -hmm. Moreover, he thinks with Birkenfeld and beyond him of the European model as a concept of a transnational democracy. So we are very eager what he will discuss today. Klaus Offel. Professor Emeritus of the Theory of the State at Hertie School of Governance in Berlin, I think needs as a permanent fellow here at the Institute uh, no, uh, no uh, further introduction in, his, uh, in this hall and especially as a, one of the most distinguished scholars of both political science and sociology. I read him now from the days of my undergraduate studies on, and I cannot stop doing so, I have to admit. Among his articles, there is one piece in which he has discussed the dictum from the angle of democratic theory, but I know that he is now interested also in Birkenfeld's critique of the capitalistic market society, as well as um, his political theory conceptual analysis. So we are curious about his thoughts on Birkenfeld today. Before giving the floor to um, the two speakers, we, um, Miriam and I, would like to bring to your attention some of his key concepts of his constitutional and political so thoughts and uh, place these concepts into context. What we really admire also with regard to Birkenfeld's work, what we learn from him, him is that concepts have to be placed in context. So, and Miriam will present this to you. We think that we have now um, about um, 15 and 20 and 20 minutes, so that at roundabout at, at seven, we can have a discussion. So, Miriam, please go Thank ahead. You. Okay. <clears throat> Why, as Wolfgang Birkenförde? Why an English edition in two volumes? The first one representing his work on constitutional and political theory and the second one with articles dealing with religion, law, and democracy. Ernst Wolfgang Böckenförde is one of Germany's foremost legal scholars and political thinkers. As a scholar of constitutional law, Böckenförde has been a major contributor to contemporary debates in legal and political theory, to the conceptual framework of the modern state and its presuppositions, and to debates about various political and ethical problems, ranging from the deployment of nuclear missiles to the ethics of genetic engineering. As a judge on Germany's federal constitutional court from December 1983 until May 1996, and as the author of the highest number of dissenting opinions in the court's history, mm. Birkenfeld has influenced the way in which academics and citizens in German-speaking lands think about law and politics. His interventions as a scholar and judge have shaped not only academic, but also wider public debates from the 1950s to the present. Let us highlight three key episodes in Birkenfeld's career and the works mostly associated with these. Birkenfeld was appointed to his first professorship, a professorship in constitutional law and legal theory, at the University of Heidelberg in 1964, so at the age of 34. He soon was promoted to dean of the law faculty and became one of the national advocates for the reform of the study of law that would integrate more practical training. After five years at Heidelberg, he moved on, together with his friend and colleague Rainer Koselek, with whom he had taught a course together, to the newly founded University of Bielefeld. Here, Birkenfeld developed his full critique of the German constitutional court's jurisprudence, which from his perspective had since the late 1950s become too programmatic and too activist. His analysis of how constitutional rights after the famous Lüth decision were no longer defensive rights against state intrusion, but also rights embedded in an allegedly objective order of values, gave rise to an entire generation of basic rights scholarship in Germany, of which Robert Alexis' account has become the most internationally prominent. 
It is in the aftermath of this period, in the late 1970s, that Buckenfurdy developed some of his most interesting and some of his most liberal work. This is the second episode I wish to highlight. It was in the context of the emergence of radical leftist movements in West Germany, at the forefront the Red Army faction, which threatened to bring down the young West German democracy. Reflecting on the 1968 emergency laws that were active at the time in order to deal with the activities of the Red Army faction, Buckenfurter wrote an article titled The Repressed State of Emergency. This was also his inaugural address at the University of Freiburg to which he moved in 1976 and a lecture that he dedicated to Carl Schmitt. It's also included in, in the volume that we just published. In this article, The Repressed State of Emergency, he argued provocatively that the 1968 emergency laws went even beyond the 1933 Enabling Act in allowing the erosion of the rule of law, justified by a war against internal enemies. And he provided numerous examples of how exactly that had just happened. For example, violations of attorney-client privileges, installations of eavesdropping devices on regular citizens, etc. Criticizing the 1968 emergency laws and drawing extensively on the work of Carl Schmitt, in particular his differentiation between law and measure, Buckenfeder argued that a state of emergency ought to be embedded in the Constitution and very tightly circumscribed. In a follow-up article, he developed a blueprint of a constitutional amendment that would fulfill these criteria as he had laid them out earlier and that he argued would be more rights-preserving than rights-eroding. As some of you may know, this blueprint never materialized and the German law remained unamended in this regard. This period of intense writing about the most liberal way of preserving a democracy under threat was followed by a 12-year period during which he served as the judge on Germany's federal constitutional court and during which he published little as is customary for judges on the bench, except, of course, for those 11 dissenting opinions. After his retirement from the court, the third episode began and he concentrated mostly on questions of European integration, globalization, and how democracy can accommodate the challenges emanating from an increasingly diverse citizenry. We will discuss some of these works later here tonight. It is difficult to pigeonhole Buckenfurter on a left-right continuum. He appears progressive in some ways. For example, he argues dual citizenship does not pose for him a problem of torn loyalty. And he appears conservative in others. He argues that people need grounding in families and states need to mold their students in school. Buckenfurter writes as a social democrat, as a political liberal, and as a committed Catholic. As a Catholic, he is concerned with questions of social cohesion, political community, and the ethical foundations of a state. What holds the citizenry together? Should the state promote certain worldviews over others, which he ultimately negates? As a social democrat, he deeply cares about not only political, but also economic and social injustices. Here he builds on the work of 19th century political thinker Lorenz von Stein, who argued in favor of the social welfare state against the backdrop of the emergence of industrial capitalism. For Böckenförder, it is the duty of the democratic state to address economic injustices, and no political stability can be achieved without social and economic security. Moreover, Certain rights cannot be enjoyed without certain economic conditions being met first. Social standards are part of the Rechtsstaat too, and it is misleading to think of these two as necessary opposites, as the Rechtsstaat versus Sozialstaat debate suggested. Considering the challenges constitutional democracies face today, Frankfurter's writings could hardly be more relevant. We already heard earlier today his widely quoted thesis the liberal, secularized state draws its life from presuppositions that it cannot itself guarantee. Here, Birkenfeld pointed to the problem that the modern constitutional state, as a necessarily secular state, cannot resort to imposing certain values or worldviews on its citizens without undermining the very liberalism on which it is founded. The rule of law and democratic procedures, so Birkenfeld, cannot be sustained in the long term unless they are carried by people who consider themselves part of the same demos. That is what he means with the concept of social homogeneity. Mm. Quote, it's a socio-psychological condition, end of quote, 
that binds the people to one another, that prompts them to work towards a common good. Like Hermann Heller, on whom Böckenförde draws here, his notion of homogeneity is fluid and constructed. What binds the people together is in flux and needs to be constantly recreated by the people themselves. It consists of an implicit agreement about the things that cannot be voted upon. Most importantly, the principles of democracy, the rule of law, liberalism. A shared understanding about the pre-political basis of the political community. Let us come to a close. Many democracies suffer today from depolarization, pandered by economic inequality and increasingly separate life worlds with divergent cultural outlooks, nationalist versus cosmopolitan, particularistic versus universalist, <coughs> laissez-faire versus regulatory views of government. New culture wars have emerged accompanied by new nationalist populisms. Beckenford's writings on how plural societies need to and can come to a shared understanding of their responsibilities to one another as citizens, and which tools are at the disposal of the state in this undertaking, and which of society, by contrast, are of central interest in this regard. Please. Thank you, Miriam. So, Alexander, why don't you? Am I next? OK, very good. Uh, let me preface my remarks. I also have a few prepared remarks that I would like to read a little bit later, because it makes things faster. Yeah. But let me preface it by recounting the times in the 1980s, basically, when I made my first encounter with Böckenförde. And I made it through my teacher, Gerhard Luth, who was also a fairly liberal, or who is also still a fairly liberal Roman Catholic. And for him, of course, the writings by Böckenförde, in particular his first book, Staatsgesellschaft Freiheit, was something like the New Testament in the theory of states. Yeah? So instead of reading all the old stuff that was written in the 19th century and the early 20th century, you finally have you would finally have a source that is sufficiently up to date and consistent with our shared belief in constitutional democracy. And I read, in a sense, with the innocence of a disciple, uh, Birkenfelder as as an author who gives us a, a, a reasonable, reasonably enlightened perspective on the conditions of modern constitutional democracy. And then I stopped reading Beckenförder, went to the United States, became a student of European integration, and I owe it to Miriam, actually, and to Miriam's project and Tina's project, uh, that I returned to reading Beckenförder. And what I discovered there then, then, and you know, this is already the, the 21st century, yeah, I discovered an author that all of a sudden looked a little bit old-fashioned old-fashioned in particular when it comes to the fundamental conditions that provide for the cohesion that is necessary in order to make the rule of law possible. And so I've grown a little bit ambivalent about Birkenförde, and I want to underscore it is ambivalent because I find my straightforward post-nationalist beliefs into more advanced form of human integration that no longer needs a nation state challenged by the way Birkenförde uses very old, very old-fashioned and, in a sense, relatively reliable vocabulary that has served us well in political theory for many, many decades uh, in order to understand political integration in the European Union. And that's what I want to talk about. Birkenförde's view on political integration in the European Union. The first contrast that he draws is not the integration by stealth that we've seen in the European Union. This is something that is almost fraudulent. That's not what we want to pursue any further. We need real political integration. What are the conditions? And here they are. First, political integration has to be based on a clear idea of the final purpose of the Union. So he criticizes the European Union for constantly shifting the purpose, depending on the type of crisis that we're confronted with. Yeah? If you have an economic crisis, we need the European Union in order to stabilize the economy. If we have a refugee crisis, we need the European Union in order to regulate that. No, he says, we need to have a clear understanding of the purpose. Second, the objective, this objective and purpose of the European Union can only be determined if we have a rough sense of how we want to live together uh, and, yeah, of how we want to live and how we want to live together. This sense of what the type of life is that we want to realize in the European Union 
is again dependent, that we can form a shared perspective on this, is dependent on a sense of belonging. It is in, in this context that he's always this, he makes this reference to Ralph Dahndorf. Right? Yeah, sense of belonging, actually, he makes the reference in, in English. Yeah? So his, his texts are in German, but the reference to the sense of belonging is in English. Yeah? And fourth, a sense of belonging is eventually based upon shared cultural roots. So Birkenfelder is keen on exploring the political alternatives to the current state of the European Union, and his political imagination is very much inspired by three evolutionary universals. You could call them, using Parsonian language, three evolutionary universals, institutions and form of consciousness that have historically emerged but attained a sense of universal significance. You cannot do without them any longer. And these three evolutionary universals are statehood, nationhood, and democracy. Very German, huh? In his view, modern democracy is only possible within a nation state. The citizens of a nation state share the sentiment of belonging together and of belonging to a place that is essentially their own. And it sounds even worse in German. Das eigene. Yeah? It, is, it is their own in the sense, das eigene. Yeah? And this is also the place where people share a somewhat similar outlook on life and join a collectively constructed memory in order to determine where they have come from and where they have to go in light of their, of their inheritance. So on the basis of this template, this is with what he starts, Birkenfelder arrives at three options that he considers feasible for the European Union. It's interesting that he explores these three options, and I for one find the third option most fascinating. The first option is a European of nation that embraces a strong principle of subsidiarity. And this has now become the agenda of conservative and right-wing parties in the European Union. The core of Europe would be composed of nation-states delegating, in a way that is revocable, authority to the European Union. That's the image of European integration that you also find manifest in the opinions of the uh, Federal Constitutional Court of Germany. It's all delegated authority uh, that we de delegate subject to the conditions of our nation states, and the nation state comes, comes first. So this is this would be the first option, and we don't need to talk about it much. The second option is more interesting. It would cast Europe also as a nation, because no integration without a nation, but as a thin nation. Not all nations are alike with regard to their form. In Birkenfelder's view, Switzerland is a special case in that it combines French and German ideals of nationhood in order to sustain a thicker understanding of nationality on the canton level, so on the more regional level, and a thinner understanding of nationality on the federal level. And he believes that if the European Union as a federal system has a bright future, it actually should look a little bit more closely at Switzerland and how Switzerland has done it because this could be the model for the European Union. So, the French and American thin understanding of the nation is that of a people that are constituted by the joint reaction to the common exposure to state power. If you realize that you are jointly exposed to the exercise of state power, you realize that you have certain interests in common. Those who are affected by the same state realize that they can take over control and once they decide that they take over the control, they are a nation in the thin sense. In order, of course, to make a bunch of affected people, an aggregate of affected people capable of exercising agency, they need to master certain things. So they have to have basic literacy, a common language, or proficiency in, in a language that is other than their native language. But this is maybe the, the only cultural condition that has in play. This is the thin form of nationhood with which you can form a state nation, as Burton Freddy calls it. But then this thinner understanding of nationhood, in his view, can uh, coexist with the thicker understanding that he, that he identifies in Switzerland at the canton level. Yeah? So there he finds the ethno-cultural understanding of the nation, and Burton Freddy believes that Switzerland has successfully combined both the thick and the thin version, in that at the canton level, the ethno cultural nations are permitted to survive and tied to certain territories. And this could be a model for the European Union. That's his second model. But here's the third model, and that's, that's the one where I began wondering, maybe he's up to something that we haven't understood yet. 
they look so terribly old-fashioned, but maybe there is something to these terribly old-fashioned ideas. Because Bettenförde is the only one, I think, who believes, <coughs> or maybe he doesn't believe it any longer, but at the time that he wrote it, he seemed to believe it. He believed that the European Union could itself grow into a nation that is more thickly constituted than the thin form of nation that you find on the federal level in Switzerland. I suspect that he believes that if efforts were undertaken in favor of more political integration, they could give rise to this effect even in the European Union. Birkenförde addresses the pre-political conditions that would have to be in place in order to make this happen. And it's a little bit embarrassing when I now state these conditions. Awareness would have to be raised, he suggests, of a common culture and cultural legacy. Christianity, but mind, not any type of Christianity, Roman, Latin Christianity, or alternatively, the Enlightenment. The obvious problem with this suggestion is that all of that that we have in common as Europeans, Christianity, Enlightenment, is also what has divided us for centuries. Christian monotheism is a mixed blessing, no pun intended. And so is the mechanical and disenchanted world of the West. What Burton very correctly, in my opinion, invites our attention to also is that no integration in a socially meaningful way is possible without constructing a common memory. And at this point, I think it becomes a little bit more fascinating. European integration as a project has been underway for quite some time. We are telling ourselves stories about the reasons why the European Union was brought into existence and what it is that we want to avoid in the future, the type of better future that we want to have. And this is a story that involves common struggles and involves common struggles now even to create something that is more appealing than the bureaucratic Leviathan that we have created in particular in the aftermath of the fiscal and economic crisis in Europe. So, Birkenfeld reminds us that we may believe that we have already conquered the ter terrain of post-national democracy, but possibly what is underway already on the European level, and we don't state it correctly because we don't want to see it because we find it embarrassing, is the beginning of an incremental process of nation-building in Europe. Let me conclude if I have a few more minutes. Over the last few decades, in particular in European Union studies, we've encountered various new vocabularies with which scholars attempted to describe Europe's unprecedented legal and political structure, such as multi-level governance, deliberative supranation, supranationalism, and what have you. We have also only patiently observed how minor variations in administrative problem solving, such as the open method of coordination were celebrated as though they had equaled the invention of the wheel on the political sphere. But all of this is gone. It's no longer appealing. Bettenferre, the old-fashioned theorist, has kept faith with the standard vocabulary of European public law. Sovereignty, secularization, the Rechtsstaat, the nation, relative homogeneity, <coughs> and yes, we even encounter this term, Schicksalsgemeinschaft. The current situation of integration may even reveal that this vocabulary is not at all obsolete. And using it cautiously, of course, yeah, we have to wear gloves when we use it, yeah, does not necessarily commit us to the darker legacies of law. I conclude. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the um, differentiation you. you put here in Berkeley Party, yeah, and um, that we can really. Um, um, see light and shadow with regard to the European yeah. integration. Klaus. I should say that I'm a social scientist and not a, a public law person, although uh, I've always been interested in political theory. And uh, Birkenfarde uh, was always uh, a puzzle uh, for me for many reasons. And uh, one of the reasons is that um, he is uh, well known uh, to the outside world, outside of uh, uh, public law, Ruizicke. 
uh, studies of state and statehood, as uh, he, he's given three attributes. First, he, he's a Schmittian, a disciple of Karl Schmitt, whom he met at an early age and was strongly fascinated and impressed by his writings of the mm. 20s. Uh, second, being a social democrat for uh, more than 50 years, uh, was celebrated as an uh, advisor to social democratic leaders and so on. And thirdly, being a Roman Catholic, very uh, engaged and committed also uh, in exchange with uh, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, to many people, uh, me not excluded, these three characteristics uh, look like a coincidencia oppositor, <laughs> uh, not easily um, amalgamated. And uh, uh, the tensions inherent in, in this are uh, to be followed in his work. I, I think it is very timely that um, uh, this enormously productive uh, person as an academic teacher as well as a judge on the Constitutional Court, justice we say, right, on the Constitutional Court, uh, uh, comes out and, uh, in English uh, and uh, the editors have done a great uh, job uh, with their lucid introductions to the volume which is the first of two volumes, right? Uh, the other one is uh, still in the planning stage. Um, and uh, they have managed also through, thanks to a uh, really uh, excellent uh, translation of the many Teutonic oh, yeah. terminology uh, that uh, uh, you find in Bretton Charles, they have managed uh, to make it uh, accessible. The only parallel I can uh, think of that uh, Hegel's phenomenology of mind, I have studied in English and I found it much easier mm -hmm. to understand him in English than in the German original and this may be a, a parallel uh, case. So uh, well, through the uh, superb uh, uh, historical, biographical, philological research uh, and uh, uh, you two are probably the only people who know uh, exactly everything about the work and the person and the relation and the setting in the, uh, 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 in the history. So, um, okay, so uh, uh, Burton Fowler shares uh, with uh, Karl Schmidt a deeply sociological understanding of the legal order. It is not uh, deductive reasoning from norms, it is a interpretation of uh, um, in, uh, social democratic speech of the Bundesbahn uh, program, the basic contradictions of our age, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's uh, what it, he is obsessed with. And uh, I come to that, what I think is the uh, object of his uh, obsession. Um, uh, he is, uh, and describes himself very pronouncedly as a liberal a disciple of uh, Karl Schmidt, which may be another uh, contradiction in terms. Uh, is such a thing uh, a liberalized version of Karl Schmidt? Is that thinkable, or conceivable? I mean, um, uh, as uh, Karl Schmidt very clearly states, that liberal rights are apolitical and are inferior to the sphere of the political, right, as it always uh, uh, is used by uh, uh, Schmidt in, as a substantive, the political, the political sphere, one would say probably in English. Uh, and liberal rights are inferior to the political, which is 
following Max Weber, uh, Habermas in 1964 at the sociology convention in um, Heidelberg, Anders Bursley of Max Weber, has caused a furor of um, uh, the um, uh, sociologists and philosophers who were present, and he said, Kashmir is a legitimate son of Max Weber. Mm -hmm. That is certainly the case, and, and undoubtedly, uh, unobjectionably, uh, the case if it comes to the concept uh, uh, of the political in Max Weber, which is equivalent in one term. It is camp, it is struggle, it is uh, uh, nothing uh, normative, it is an existential mm -hmm. givenness of conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in uh, Weber and Schmidt, a conflict that unfolds between nation states, uh, that uh, uh, which also implies a priority or the pre prevalence or pre domination of international uh, for uh, over uh, national issues. And mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, given this uh, overwhelming importance of the international struggle, uh, 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 liberal rights uh, uh, have an inferior position. Very interesting in in the in the, in the detail in the uh, uh, chapter that is reprinted here in translation on uh, the notion of the political. Uh, Burton Fowler uh, adopts the position of a advanced graduate student mm -hmm. who does not really take position on these uh, uh, issues. Yeah. He uh, tries to give a detailed, nuanced, and uh, faithful report on what the great master had said without talking, as he was at the beginning, about the person, nothing about the person, only about the work, right? And uh, there he uh, he refrained from judgment uh, here, and he quotes a line that I find found really shocking when I reread this. I found it shocking 30 years ago when I first read, uh, and that is in the 20s. Carl Schmidt thinks about the dangers. Uh, the dangers that um, originate from the Lichtspiel, the emerging cinema as a mode of communication. And uh, Karl Schmidt says this is of so great importance for shaping the unity of the people and the mentality that mm -hmm. this cannot be uh, subject to liberal rules. You know, you cannot uh, make the movie you want or uh, uh, attend the uh, presentation. The movie uh, needs to be strictly conceptualized as something that is part of the struggle. Uh, and uh, uh, liberalism, uh, freedom of everything that in Germany comes under Article 5, right? Freedom of expression, art, freedom yeah. of expression, freedom of opinion has to uh, uh, take a Okay, so so the, the, there is a clearly uh, um, the full recognition of the authoritarian implication of Karl Schmitt's Verfassungslehre, uh, uh, constitutional theory, but he <coughs> excuse me, he does not pass judgment on this, which I found very interesting. And you can follow the the ambivalence in the details of the of the style. Another remark, um, or a continuation of the same, uh, the protection of freedom um, uh, is not uh, uh, inspired by values. Schmidt has a deep contempt for values. Uh, and uh, he, I remember some poetry he wrote, very mediocre po poetry in the 60s. Uh, where he uh, uh, makes fun of uh, things like Menschenwürde, uh, human dignity as a 
this is uh, absolutely outside of any political reality of, uh, of struggle. Uh, uh, it is uh, all what is important is, I don't think it comes, uh, but it is exactly the uh, same idea as in Machiavelli, mantenere lo Stato, uh, defending, maintaining the state against other states and uh, in this uh, uh, dark uh, uh, situation of existential, eternal uh, uh, struggle that domestic policies needs to be subordinated to. Um, I, I skipped a part on, on uh, Forsthoff because I was not certain whether to what extent Forsthoff himself uh, is uh, closer to uh, Forsthoff in the mm -hmm. 50s and uh, closer to uh, Schmidt or closer to uh, uh, Beckenförde, but they uh, all uh, struggle with the same uh, problem. How to uh, uh, reconcile uh, liberalism of rights, of rule of law, of basic uh, uh, basic rights on the one hand with the uh, uh, superior uh, objective of maintaining uh, the uh, uh, the state. And that means uh, the unity, and that is a, uh, the Einheit, uh, uh, the unity or homogeneity or how to manage conflict given the fact that internal conflict means external weakness and uh, how to manage conflict how to create the uh, minimum required level of homogeneity solidarity a sense of belonging and so on and so on the, 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 the 10 or 12 different terms meaning the same uh, uh, that is how to manage conflict. And the, the famous, uh, is only one example of the famous dictum, is only one example. How to manage conflict, uh, grant freedom up to the point where it becomes so dangerous that authoritarianism will set in, or uh, for the sake of maintaining the state, uh, uh, or uh, the state collapses under the uh, pressure of internal conflict. That is, I think, the theme that he, uh, and he identifies again and again uh, uh, sources of weakness, how the state can fail to generate uh, this homogeneity, uh, globalization, Europeanization, uh, uh, individualization, these are all examples of uh, uh, dangerous sources of uh, disintegration, and they needs to be need to be coped with. He is far from advocating uh, the sacrifice of rights for the sake uh, of. Uh, but he he sees the conflict and and uh, 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 thinks that uh, uh, that a solution must be found, and that uh, the same applies to. Uh, capitalism. Capitalism is nothing but the use of uh, basic rights uh, of contract, of property um, uh, in economic affairs, but that can lead to the rule of uh, special interests, particularism, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, trade relations which endanger the political community and its unity again and uh, again. And he recommends in passing uh, the uh, Catholic social doctrine as a remedy for uh, these uh, uh, anarchic, as Marx uh, mm -hmm. says, uh, tendencies and uh, dynamics uh, of the capitalist uh, economy. Um, So um, uh, the state cannot, as uh, Schmidt thought, forge unity through authoritarian means uh, by acclamation and plebiscitary uh, democracy. 
I mean, Schmidt is also just a disturbing line uh, that a dictatorship can only come into being by democratic means, mm -hmm. meaning by mass acclamation and the successful uh, repression, by the say, uh, uh, of uh, dissenting voices or uh, 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 social conflicts. So he does not believe in the authoritarian solution. But what are the alternatives in order to uh, uh, to uh, strengthen uh, the sense of belonging, of bonding, of civil religion? Interestingly, of the fourth chapter of the uh, of the uh, fourth book of Kampasse uh, Schall, uh, civil religion. He invokes that there must be a not necessarily not necessarily religious religion, a civil religion, a, a background consensus on what the rules are and what the duties of citizenship imply. And that, of course, uh, overlaps with a strong uh, 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 social science uh, uh, topic, uh, social capital uh, studies in the 90s uh, for Putnam, uh, the, uh, the idea of friendship, civic friendship, uh, 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 the ethical state that maintains internal peace, uh, but we don't know how to, to uh, bring it into being. And here my, my uh, uh, question is, why is it, uh, how promising is it to appeal to a normative uh, culture uh, that he tries to formulate again and again what the criteria are. And you have mentioned one of mm -hmm. the list of, uh, and let me mention another one to mm -hmm. show how, how typical and how mm -hmm. often it's, uh, it comes. He names, he, he names uh, in the uh, article on the future of political autonomy four uh, elements of this uh, he called still another author, cement of society. Right? The cement of society is religion in the first instance. The second is a shared consciousness of being a people. Mm -hmm. That is some kind of what in our Marx figures as, as civic solidarity. We all belong to, uh, uh, together. And from that evolves a national consciousness um, uh, the self-awareness combined with the political will to be autonomous, and finally, fourthly, a consolidated, mentally internalized cultural heritage that refers to a specific way of life, um, uh, and so on. It reminds you a bit of the light culture debate uh, that uh, occasionally is brought up, and that is so terribly hopeless. I mean, no one can define what light culture is, except for the uh, clearly anti-Islamic uh, requirement that you shake hands with men, between men and women, right? That is, uh, and there's no way specifically German, other people do that as well as, as far as I know. And not all Germans do it. Uh, uh, so, the, the, the so that's one question. Is that is there something of that sort of Lüttlichkeit uh, mm -hmm. cement uh, uh, available? Mm -hmm. And the second question, and in particular if the answer to the first question is no, as I think it is, um, then the, are there more promising alternative means? Uh, in other words, why does it not uh, burden further? rely more on Fashion, who has uh, a concept of homogeneity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otto Kirchheimer. Yeah. Otto Kirchheimer, who has in his uh, uh, writings in the early 30s uh, the theory that uh, uh, socialism and the uh, socialist reorganization of the uh, relations of production uh, will create a homogeneity that is not to be had uh, uh, at the uh, level of uh, 
uh, culture. Uh, so the relationship of economy and culture is not uh, at present uh, discussed, with the one exception of this great uh, far-sighted uh, visionary uh, uh, essay on Europe, where he says uh, it is unpromising uh, to uh, expect that uh, uh, unity and cohesion will be the outcome of market interaction. Mm -hmm. Liberalization of market will not do the job. We need a political conception of Europe. Mm -hmm. And you uh, hinted at what uh, uh, the answers uh, are. So, I mean, uh, it is a, a question that uh, is discussed in a wide uh, variety of ways and projects in many countries in the social sciences. We have uh, the clear and overwhelming evidence of uh, apathy and political alienation, including the, the most recent work on this is in yesterday's, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Armin Schäfer, who has done a lot of work on this. As, uh, uh, so, uh, the, the, the cohesion, uh, the capacity to manage conflict, social and economic conflict in civilized ways under the roof of institutions is uh, uh, the problem. Whether uh, any version, sophisticated or less so, uh, of light culture uh, will do the job is for me uh, an open question. Um, um, the critique of uh, the European um, integration in general, and in particular, the economic and monetary union following Maastricht, uh, is uh, uh, far-sighted, as I said. Uh, he uh, understood that uh, the common currency, as is now widely understood, and appreciated uh, is a divisive uh, uh, institution rather than a unifying convergence generating uh, institutions. Uh, Europeans are made into market citizens, not political citizens. There is much of negative integration, that is the removal of borders, but very little of positive integration. Uh, there is no social market economy at the European uh, level. Uh, the hands of member states are tied because they cannot, uh, in the name of the, uh, the rule of the European Central, Central Bank, uh, they cannot, um, and, and the assumption of one size fits all, they cannot uh, take sovereign decisions on two ex extremely important economic parameters. First, exchange rates, and second, interest rates. Uh, they are deprived of uh, this by the EMU. Um, uh, fiscal transfers between member states uh, are uh, called for, but uh, they fail because all member states think of them. Uh, first, and uh, thereby uh, following uh, uh, America first uh, uh, logic uh, within the framework of the common market. Euro the prevailing forms of European integration destroy community rather than forging and cultivating. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lars. <laughs> so, thank you, the three of you. So, a lot is on the table. Maybe just before we go to the substantial topics, um, I, when you started, um, that you could uh, read um, Hegel easier in English mm -hmm. yeah, than in German, mm -hmm. I was reminded to uh, when I first 
uh, advance a novel, so the new translation of Heidegger's Sein und Zeit, and yeah. Time and Being. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering how the Gestell and uh, das Gewesen uh, is mm -hmm. translated, but I even can't uh, re remember yeah. it yet. Yeah. It was good. <laughs> and um, now we w struggled with uh, terms like Wertgesetzlichkeit des Geistes. Yeah, that was um, in, in um, a, a term he used in his article uh, zur Kritik der Wertbegründung des Rechts, mm -hmm. Critique of the Value-Based Grounding of Law. <laughs> okay, yeah, but how to translate Wertgesetzlichkeit des Geistes? And then we decided for the historical, culturally shaped nomological dimension of value. So sometimes you need a, you need a lot more words, yeah? How, how or, do or the, what does is not really help, and, yeah. and in, in referring to um, the other, the Weimar uh, Staatsrechtslehrer, constitutional lawyer, um, Hermann Heller, he used um, Staat als Handlungseinheit, mm -hmm. and we decided yeah. for unifying framework of action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of discussions how to translate yeah. these very German terms. And just to give you a last example, how to translate, um, it sounds very easy, Grundsatznormen. Yeah? Grundsatznormen. He refers uh, uh, to this as um, the, the um, basic rights as Grundsatznormen. So we first thought Basic norms would be nice, wouldn't it? Basic norms, Grundsatz norms. That sounds good. Grundsatz. But then, exactly, <laughs> we realized that uh, Kelvin was al already translated with basic norms for mm -hmm. Grundnorm. Yeah. So we yeah. have to look for another term, and yeah. then finally, uh, we decided for constitutional principles. Uh, what brings Birkenförder to a close relationship to uh, Robert Alexi? In, yeah. in one way or another. Yeah. So just to give you an impression but that it was at some point not that easy yeah. to find the uh, right term. Um, but um, with regard to the uh, substantial issues you put on the table, that mm -hmm. was quite interesting that mm -hmm. were some parallels uh, how you refer to the his critique of the European Union. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we could also focus in the discussion uh, as well on the, on the puzzle that uh, Birkenförder is for Klaus Offer as mm -hmm. being a Schmidtian, a social democrat, and a Catholic at the same time. Yeah, so we mm -hmm. struggled with this as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, maybe one has to say, well, in a long life there can be also developments and tensions. Yeah, yeah that mm -hmm. roots in your biography. It's it's not that you can bring it all into a um, logic structure of your of your thoughts. But, but would you agree that this is a red thread uh, in his work, uh, the, 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 the issue of unity and mm -hmm. uh, homogeneity yeah. and convergence yeah. and solidarity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I would just add to the characteristic uh, that he's a liberal also, right? He's not only a social democratic Catholic and a Schmittian, but he's also really a liberal, and you see it in his writings on, on the state of emergency, and he, of course, he's yeah. very pronounced also in his own critique of the Catholic Church. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this liberal uh, element, I think, actually becomes stronger from the 1970s onwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Feel free to join us in the discussion with your comments, remarks, questions. Yeah. Maybe just you could say who you no, are. No, they are. need them. Yeah. The mic. Is it? Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. So thank you very much. The talk was fantastic, very enlightening and interesting. Um, my name is Martina. I am a recent graduate, and I'm just quite interested in social sciences, law, and so on, and in um, the European Union as an institution. So I would like to ask a question. Um, to what extent do you think that um, Birkenford is three options for the future of the European mm -hmm. Union actually exhaust the potential outcomes of the situation that we are currently in. That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> whether this is an exhaustive list, whether, whether there is more. Let me reply by not answering your question, but explain, let me try to explain to you what my question is. That I, that I find um, 
that I encounter in, in Burton Curtis' work. A number of people um, write about the European Union today as though it was the solution to all the, the evils that we've seen in European history because we've created a post-national, or we have the basis for creating a post-national form of integration. Um, there are authors in Austria in particular that say, well, we can finally begin to realize that our true identity is on the regional level, that we are fully integrated, homogeneous on the regional level, but not on the national level. And therefore, we can eliminate this intermediate layer of integration that we have in Europe, in the nation state in the long run, we have a post-national community on the one hand, and the regional level on the other. On the regional level, we are, in Birkenkirchen terms, thickly constituted, yeah? And on the European level, we have this thin form of constitution. But what is it? What is on earth is a post-national community? How is a post-national community possible if it is not based on a narrative that we develop about how we have come to live together, what it is that we share, that we treasure, and that we want to sustain in the face of all kinds of challenges that we, that we are posed? Yeah? Uh, a history that we impart on the next generation that we believe tells the story of our society in a relatively correct way, something that we teach in school. Yeah? How is this different from building a nation? And that's the question that I encounter in Berkenstein. So maybe, maybe the list is exhausted. So here's my reply, it's exhausted. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's all there is. Yeah? That's the question that I have. How is a post-national community different from a national community that, and I, let, let, me, let me clarify it, that uses uh, historical narratives as a means of integration? Not blood, not the soil, uh, not some kind of inheritance that is mediated by biological means. Yeah? Not this kind of story. No. It, it is a community that actually confront the fact that they are based on a historical contingency, that they are dealing with a contingent form of community. Not, there's not, nothing that is necessary about being together in this way. Yeah? It just has happened at a certain point. And when you, you need a narrative that is both forward-looking, forward -looking in the sense uh, yeah. of finality, yeah. and backward-looking, backward -looking. Uh, right. and uh, looking yeah. at the history of the 20th century. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and this that is a is story that is very similar to the German story because it begins at a very negative moment in European history, the Holocaust and the Second World War, yeah? and the attempt to do it better in the future. Yeah? Okay. yeah, I mean, I think one can maybe w add one thing that what Burton Curtis writes about in terms of how this could have been achieved, right? So his, ba his main article in 1997, Which Way Is Europe Going? Mm -hmm. um, he laments the fact that uh, there isn't a common news agency. Everybody still checks their national news first and foremost. I think we all right. still do it today, yeah. actually, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you check Le Monde every evening or El Pais. I think we, yeah. we, we tend to, to read our national newspapers. Yeah. Um, also, the, the textbooks, the history textbooks, are still nationally written. And already in 1997, he wrote, well, what we need is textbook commissions that w work on history textbooks that are translated into the different languages, but that are European in character and not based on national yeah. history writing. Yeah. And similarly with, with uh, right. thinking about the news and really trying yeah. to identify with one another, also in terms of the Schicksalsgemeinschaft, you can only start to do that right. if you're very well informed about the life conditions of those right. who live in other yeah. countries within the European yeah. Union. And, and all of that is missing. So yeah. it's really the cultural integration that he thinks um, is, is, is the key, yeah. Um, yeah. just as much as the political integration. And he, he quotes Jean Monnet, who must have said at a certain point, I just take it from Beckenkörde, Next time, I would begin with this culture. culture. This yeah. is what he quotes. Yeah, yeah, I right, haven't yeah. have have checked this. Mm -hmm. But you, want, you yeah. want to do that yeah. in 24 languages. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I need to switch on. Or no, it's, I think it's already on. It is already switched on. I'm Friedel Weiss. I'm a pension boss colleague of uh, Alexander Tomek. Um, unfortunately, I know pretty little about uh, Birkenfelder, his work, and his uh, political theory, etc. But I want to take up a few points that were made uh, before, the, the rich harvest of debating points. Uh, 
commitment to start with a little anecdote. I used to work at the London School of Economics while Dan Dorf was its director. And we had a habit of inviting newly appointed lecturers, young people, for a, for a dinner. And I was seated next to him. And of course, he spoke in German. So mm -hmm. I asked him a question. Uh, what do you think about Rudi Dutschke? Because I still remembered him confronting me with this chair in the Empire campus, I believe, of Constance University. I'm not sure where mm -hmm. exactly, mm -hmm. but they shouted at each other, etc., etc. He leaned over to me and said, he was an idiot. <laughs> um, he defended his liberal preferences, political practice, etc., no doubt. We are still today trying to defend liberal practice. And it seems to be slipping away from us. Mm -hmm. And the nation state is mm -hmm. the one that watches while it's happening. Mm -hmm. The post-national system mm -hmm. that was the, the, the relief from the post-war uh, oppression mm -hmm. practiced by the nation state, then was then transformed by the failing of the nation state, the, the post-war so state the UN, yeah. multilateral, yep. Europe, yep. regional, same yep. thing. Yep. All of a sudden, the Heimat Partei has its yeah. We are facing, uh, sorry, I made the reference to mm. yesterday's, or the day before yesterday's uh, election here. Uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we are confronted by our neighbors' current practice, proclamation of the illiberal democracy. <laughs> and there, is, there are signs that we're actually trying to, some, some parties have have come out successfully, mm. openly advocate joining the Visegrad group of states, all of which are in the, in the, in the, uh, are the target of the European Commission mm -hmm. for breaches of the fundamental values of the European mm. Wertegemeinschaft. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have no tools, but I think the idea that the nation state is something to be celebrated and that it is the, the unit alone that can function is, by its, is, is questionable. It's the nation state that adheres to such deviations and needs corrections from time to time. And I don't, and I, I keep saying to my students, the value of, because uh, the gentleman mentioned the internal market alone is not going to bring it. Nobody loves the market, we know that. Nobody bonds with the market, we cannot do yeah. that. Yeah. I fully agree. But recently, the European Union has not only demonstrated that the market at least works because it's left alone by interference from nation states. Not all Even though in the agree. 80s, as you well know, the stagnation period, the whole decade, was in stagnation. Why? Because nation states refused to cooperate, hmm. refused to go along with proposed legislations made by the Commission. Anyway, that's history. Mm -hmm. But... I keep saying the European Union, the value to its citizens is primarily in the potential protection against their own government. And that is something that is not yet appreciated. When, when the Commission targets Hungary before the European Court of Justice, mm -hmm. it does so in the name of the common values and also to protect those parts of Hungarian society which wish to maintain and to adhere to those values. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a fundamental problem. If we go back to the de Gaulle's conception of the fatherlands rather than the centralized liberal practice from Brussels, we're going to be in trouble, I think. Good. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for your comment. Did somebody like to comment on this? I fully, I fully agree. But the, you, uh, I, f I fully agree with one exception. I think you assimilate the constitution of the European Union in its political function too much to the post-reconstruction constitution in the United States. The post-reconstruction constitution after the Civil War in the United States with the 14th Amendment, the basic principle is now we have the federal level to protect you against the state. This is the core idea. And it's a different problem that arises. Well, that's not so a different problem. You get bigotry wherever you look. Yeah? European Union, United States, it's basically the same problem. But we have to expect more from the European Union because the system of federalism that we have created now 
is a system that really undermines the European Union. It is something that makes it yeah. not loved in the eyes of the European Union because it's always easy to shift the blame on more progress. That's right. Yeah, let's go for it. The only point that I wanted to make with regard to the nation state and why I think that we can learn a little bit from Birkenstadt is that, well, if we observe correctly what we do in allegedly building a post national community, is in the intellectual operations that we perform and the kind of uh, narrative that we want to create is something that's very similar that has gone on in nation states as well. But I agree with you. The European Union is about taming the nation state. That's, that's its most important function. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. Oh well. So. Uh, well, yeah. if I may, uh, the European Union is uh, uh, not successfully uh, taming the nation state uh, because it cannot uh, impose rules uh, that would uh, further uh, what is called convergence uh, yeah. the uh, level uh, the, the playing field is ever more tilted mm -hmm. some play ever more tilted uh, yeah. some play uphill and some play downhill and uh, uh, the European Union has not. The, uh, I mean, market liberalization has turned out to be, to quote uh, uh, Karl von Polanyi, uh, a satanic mill where some win and some lose. And, uh, 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 and, uh, and in this Europe uh, article of uh, 1970, uh, foreshadow some of these effects with which we have yeah. to live today. Yeah. The alternative is not Orban's illiberal uh, democracy, uh, but a, uh, a better Europe, right? And, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it is not certain uh, after uh, the recent two elections that we have gone through uh, and its uh, results. I mean, uh, Germany and Austria, not the French. It is not uh, uh, certain, uh, not visible with any confidence that this situation of a satanic mill will uh, improve in the near future. Mm. And if you, uh, as I have done recently uh, several times, uh, visit the discourses in Greece, mm. uh, then you get a very clear picture mm -hmm. of the of the. Uh, uh, the satisfaction, the anger, the rage, uh, and the uh, frustration over this development. Thank you. What's the hand over the mic here to the gentleman in the first row? Because he was, I think, before you and afterwards. Yeah? Thank you. I'm also not an expert on, on booking further. My name is Stefan Aura. I teach European studies at the University of Hong Kong, and I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. I'm very keen to study booking further as a result of it. Mm -hmm. And my question uh, directs. Uh, Professor Offer, because uh, the point you made that I, 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 I kind of find uh, fascinating that it seems a major puzzle, right, Buchenförder, to be a Catholic, a Schmittian, uh, and uh, a, a, a social democrat, a liberal too. It reminds me of Alessia Kolakowski, who wrote a brilliant uh, essay about being himself a liberal, a socialist, and a conservative. And, and what I want to uh, challenge uh, you on or, or mm -hmm. put to you is that perhaps we all need uh, to learn more uh, from uh, Carl Schmidt. And I know that you won't like uh, uh, the idea. <laughs> but as we are witnessing uh, 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 serious strains of that Habermasian uh, Europe based on deliberative uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. democracy, we are probably going to benefit to learn from people who thought of politics as Conflict. When you say that you go to Greece and, and you see that. And so what I find fascinating, and that's also my area of, of uh, research interest, is that Sch Schmidt is, is a part of uh, a conversation. You, you mentioned Max Weber. Uh, and you said, can Buchenförder be a Schmittian and Democrat? Well, what about Hannah Arendt, who is a Heideggerian uh, and Democrat? And to some extent, Schmittian too, in mm -hmm. that she also thought of the political mm -hmm. as that sphere that gives our lives 
meanings. It's almost a metaphysical mm. concept of mm. the political. And what I want to but put not to you as is struggle, uh, but as macht. Yes. yes. Uh, so th th and now I want to combine your contribution and the contribution you have from that corner. Yeah. You, you said that you, you are very, if I understood you correctly, uh, when the EU is presented as a solution to all evils, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's a profoundly Schmittian insight mm -hmm. because it is about uh, the attempt yes. to remove mm -hmm. uh, uh, the political. So what I want to say provocatively mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that Europe that is post-national mm -hmm. becomes also post-political, mm -hmm. becomes technocratic mm -hmm. and, and erodes the political that Max Weber, Karl Schmitt and Hannah Arendt Defend it. And mm -hmm. now I come back to Klaus Offer because <laughs> I value your scholarship greatly and I <laughs> profoundly disagree with a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you seem to side now with Wolfgang Streg and his critique of, of Habermas when you say that the Eurozone uh, turned out oh, to yeah. be profoundly divisive. Now, the Eurozone is a perfect example of that post national, post political, apolitical, technocratic Europe, right? Mm -hmm. That Schmidt through Bukerfelder, mm -hmm. says it's never going to work because mm -hmm. it assumes mm -hmm. that there are no major uh, uh, potentials for conflict between, mm -hmm. between France and Germany, between Germany and Greece, between yeah. Germany and Poland. Imagine mm -hmm. if Poland had adopted mm -hmm. the single currency and found itself uh, uh, receiving the dictate from Berlin. Mm -hmm. You know, that <laughs> would have uh, uh, really put uh, uh, Greece's situation <laughs> into, into yeah, uh, a single. So, worse, so yeah. And these are profoundly Schmittian insights. It's just difficult for us to mm -hmm. acknowledge it because Schmidt is so embarrassingly, stupidly, outrageously wrong on key issues of his own uh, time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when it comes to uh, being co-opted to, to Nazism. But for me, his, his critique or his awareness of the imminent dangers that liberal democracy faces, which he shares with Max Weber, mm -hmm. incidentally, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and Hannah Arendt. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, uh, uh, Angela Merkel is a perfect example of this oscillation that the EU itself also experiences. Between the politics of exception, she's perfectly Schmittian when she says, or uh, supports yes, Draghi yes. to say, yeah. we do whatever it takes. Yeah. Schmittian, exception, yeah. everything goes. And the next day, she is all technocratic. It's the rule of law mm -hmm. that underpins the EU. And yes, if yes. anyone disagrees with me, he disagrees with the law of the European Union, mm -hmm. say Greece on austerity policies, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it is this oscillation between the politics of exception and technocracy. And the political, mm -hmm. the political that Weber, Karl Schmidt, and Hannah Arendt value so highly. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, is, is disappearing. And I, I realize that it's a difficult argument to make because I don't buy into Schmittian understanding that I have to kill my enemy to, to realize myself as a human being. Uh, but I, I, I imagine that there are other ways of thinking about the political that one can find in Max Weber, in Hannah Arendt, uh, that is not as naive as to think mm. that we can get, we can eradicate conflict. Mm. I mean, even mm. Immanuel mm. Kant understood yeah. we can't. Yeah. Because, because from such yeah, yeah. Uh, a crooked wood as man is made, nothing perfectly straight will ever be made. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so that is the kind of Schmittian liberalism that Europe needs more than ever. <laughs> because the post-national, post-political liberalism mm. is failing utterly. And we don't want Europe to be then taken over mm -hmm. by the likes of Orban. Mm -hmm. Schmittian yeah, liberalism, that is a topic for Klaus, I think. <laughs> 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 yeah. First Klaus? No. Do you uh, want but, to but no. Briefly, okay, no, I, 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 I see your point, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, the evaporation of the political uh, and uh, b between the two negative alternatives, namely technocracy and populism. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, 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 political yeah. means, uh, uh, if I may extrapolate from what I understand, the Schmittian argument that is to be taken seriously, or the Bayerian argument, the political would be the establishment of an institutional order that allows to process conflict in peaceful ways, mm -hmm. in its yeah. under rule, right? right? To establish a framework of rules that allows all voices to be heard, mm -hmm. and uh, 
to, through majority or corporatism or whatever, uh, the conflict to be settled. Uh, and that would be the, the proof of stateness uh, or state quality uh, mm -hmm. or the statehood, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. however it's translated, uh, the, the Staatseigenschaft mm -hmm. uh, uh, of, uh, and, and uh, I mean, one peculiarity in Schmidt is that the state is not the arena uh, of conflict, the state is the creation, uh, excuse me, uh, is not the arena of uh, the political, but the creation of the political. And that uh, creation is still uh, what we are waiting for, right? Uh, where all conflicts can be processed in a very antagonistic manner, but in an institutionally domesticated manner uh, uh, in, at the European level. That's, I, I'm being mm -hmm. We don't have that, and, and maybe, as you know. Maybe Birkenfeller, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, would add that um, in a liberal state, the last questions about metaphysics mm -hmm. is not for politics. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So that is a really um, important differentiation with mm -hmm. regard to this new interpretation of Heidegger, Arendt, and Schmidt. Mm -hmm. I would assume he would uh, say no. This has to be discussed in religious uh, communities, in, in, in yeah. scholarly uh, uh, communities, but not in the political sphere, because otherwise we will go back to the pre-Hobbesian area. Yeah. 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 So I think um, okay. one scholar over there, and you, maybe we just, the two of you, um, put together. First you, and then okay. uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Ivan Weber, a permanent fellow here at the Institute as, as of recently. Um, and I, th I think this issue of, of conflict mitigated within institutions is really a key one. An interesting work uh, that comes from France is, is Jacques Rancière's book, La Maisentente, The Disagreement, where I think there's mm -hmm. an interesting further elaboration mm -hmm. on that. And thank you very much for the presentation. I have also not been uh, privy to uh, reading uh, the author that you presented, so it's been very thought-provoking and invites to go and, and read the issues. Uh, one issue that I just wanted to raise was, of course, that we will be living with this question of how does one achieve homogeneity in community. And you know, just to go back to the French Revolution, of course, where Michelet defined it as the battle between Christianity and liberty, which I think was an interesting way of framing mm -hmm. in his you know, three volumes on the French Revolution. But then, of course, the desperate um, uh, uh, look out for, for that civic religion uh, and, and the, the attempt to, on the Rousseau's basis, create something that would substitute for a, a real, um, for a religion that had been eliminated from, from politics by uh, differentiating the state uh, from it. Uh, or Emil Durkheim, of course, who said that society is the new God. All variations on this theme, how do you go about creating that sense of being one, or you know, ultimately uh, Habermas's constitutional patriotism. And it goes harks back to, to Ernst Bloch of to the hot and cold ideas. It's much easier to mobilize around identity yeah. about yeah. the fact that you yeah. are in a community. As and we can see in the US. Uh, as we see in <laughs> the US, as uh, I saw, and Klaus was a witness, throughout Dubrovnik seminars uh, uh, of, of the breakdown of a country called Yugoslavia, where the immediate was to rally around the flag and around the nation for fear of the other. And we are unfortunately mm. seeing in its various guises the return of populism, mm. renationalization, mm. and sovereignism mm. uh, among very different uh, kinds of people from academics to the so-called ordinary people, which I think are, are, are worrying. Uh, I think that the the, one of the challenges is, uh, is the European Union was created in fair weather, in a post-World War uh, period under the American security umbrella, and basically we Europeans had to deal with ourselves and how do we create these, in, these institutions where uh, we can do conflict in a, in a civilized manner. It is when the clouds appeared mm -hmm. that the bad things started occurring again, and I think we will see whether the institutions that we have with all of their imperfections can uh, survive the tectonic 
shaking that we are seeing uh, and the challenges. I think that Brexit and Trump have been enough of a wake-up call for Europeans to realize that they have something to lose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, Joaquin, I'm Spanish. I'm Puerto Rican de Japa, so for me that's a good question. <laughs> uh, the first point is that it's kind of a joke. Uh, we are talking about the translation in the German because it's most of the book that we have in Spanish are translated directly into English. The translation is really perfect. So <laughs> we have to live hard. But what, uh, I want, I'm living now in Czech Republic. And I want to point out that the difference that we were talking about was the liberal democracy how they see the European Union, how they feel it, and why I think that it's, it's difficult to have this uh, unification. Uh, the European Union is, is, well, they are kind of uh, trying to solve them as uh, the advanced world, the, the democracy, the civil democracy. And the problem that they found is like uh, for them, and that's why the nationalism is, is increasing a lot there, <coughs> is because they don't find a, a fit like that. Slovakia also, this double food uh, quality thing, but they were talking about it and praying for a support from the European Union during one year, and they have to wait one year to, to try to be fixed. <coughs> so in this case, so you know, well, as a sociologist, I, the first thing that you have to do is to observe the thing and to talk with the people. So uh, after three years with that, uh, I can understand them in this point, like, if you don't receive a feedback, you are not going to buy the European Union. And now we feel, well, this week, this weekend we have the, the elections there. And we see three, big, three parties who are really increasing a lot there uh, in the young people. They are, uh, well, Andrei Babish, the guy who is going to be the, the prime minister. Like they, see, uh, they see him as a, as a winner, even being a uh, oligarch uh, clearly. And they have the far right from Kamura, well, they, they, are, they are talking about uh, typical stuff, uh, go out to European Union, uh, they, have, they want to block all the refugees and all these things. And the Pariah Party, who is almost in 8% now, actually. And these are the, the options that they have, the, the young people that they are seeing in the, the political uh, views. And actually, the, well, the young people, the young vote is going to jump from the 40% to the 60% in one mm -hmm. election. Due to this, I think that maybe, well, this uh, Brussels uh, rejecting the feedback with them. That's like, uh, well, they read all this conversation, they hear all the conversation between France and Germany, talking about the, this do, uh, double speed in the European Union, <coughs> and they feel clearly that it's about them. They want to join the European Union. They feel that the European Union doesn't want them. They just feel that they want. Uh, they they are wanted just for the well, well, like I'm working there in a IT company, a big IT company having their uh, the location, cheap words, cheap uh, taxes. So it's better for them. <coughs> so I think that if we don't give a, a strong feedback to the well, the Visegrad group they will never buy the European Union, at least the society. Mm -hmm. So we have a big problem because they, they, we want them because there are a lot of million people there. And the reason that we want them is to put them out of the Russian influence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we don't want them to be a full European citizen in some point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have a big problem in, in this side, and this is going to increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bring in the level of international politics, which yeah, we also have to take into account. Into the Are mm -hmm. there any other comments or remarks here in the, yeah, so, please, yes? Last remark, uh, maybe a little bit more philosophical. Uh, my name is Artem uh, Gergun, IDM Josephine Crowley. I wonder in, in what sense we can talk about something universal if we take seriously the concept that the rights are inferior from the political. Is it possible to talk, especially in legal sense, about something universal? And uh, I think this question 
contributes to, to, to the question what, what is the fate of European Union, what, what uh, universal, un uh, universality is, um, can unite this particularistic legal, economic and uh, political uh, post-national picture. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So why don't we take the chance for a last round? Yeah, and um, maybe may Alexander, I, you yeah, will start I because I think that the last one was especially addressed <laughs> yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, there's something else is on my mind that I want <laughs> to share with you. <laughs> um, I often you presented um, Birkenfelder as someone who actually emerged from the intellectual background of Carl Schmitt's constitutional theory and there's something to it but there is in one at one point a major difference between Schmidt and, and Birkenfelder and this makes him more promising as a theorist of modern constitutional democracy he has a different concept of representation the mm -hmm. concept of representation that you encounter in Carl Schmidt's constitutional theory is is outlandish and it's so amazing what you get there on the one hand representation means to make something higher something that's higher than you are yourself, present, you know, to mediate its presence. And it's actually the idea is, I think, the Roman Catholic Church mediates the presence of Christ somehow. Mm -hmm. And something similar happens if a monarch appears. This is representation. And then you have, on the other hand, identity, the chanting crowd, you know, the vulgar, the vulgar image of democracy that Carl Schmidt had. It's full of the vision of democracy that Carl Schmidt had. Nothing of this you find in Birkenfelder. Yeah. Birkenfelder believes that representation is an important process in which you have a representative that engages in some kind of dialogue with the voting public, proposes certain topics, proposes certain courses of action that the public should take, and then the public replies. This is the process of representation. And he says that the public requires the initiative of someone who actually proposes the topic, provides the language, yeah, um, and presents the problems. This is how it, wo how it works in a modern mass democracy. And that's important, I think, also uh, to understand the right form of an antagonism in the European Union. The antagonism that we have in the European Union today, we have antagonist democracy in the, in the Chantal, Mouf, in Chantal Mouf sense, yeah? but we have it between the nation states. It's exactly the kind of antagonism that Schmidt had in mind when he talked about the political, because the political is all about foreign affairs. Internally, mm -hmm. you have only political. Mm -hmm. That's the tragedy. That's the tragedy. That's the yeah. Shows that the what? of populism is actually the yeah. But what mm -hmm. what we would need is representatives in the European Union that talk to the European public at large and mm -hmm. speak to people in order to make them aware of that they have that they have interests that they share, that they're interests that the Germans and the and the and the, and the Greek. Uh, people share, yeah? in particular uh, the members of the working class in these countries and so forth. This is the right form of antagonism, the right form of Schmidtianism, yeah? that you would get it through this representative institution and not the real existing Schmidtianism that we have today in the European Union in relationship between the member states, yeah? and among certain member states. Okay, I conclude here. Thank you. Okay. 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 Yeah. I, w I would like to come back to one little uh, hint of footnote I had in my uh, presentation and uh, strengthen one point, uh, namely that homogeneity uh, or fellow feeling or whatever you want to call it uh, can be uh, uh, established uh, at the cultural level. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, the horse uh, Birkenfelder mm -hmm. seems to bet on. Right? Yeah, that's right. It could also be um, done in a, if you strengthen his social democratic side, um, in terms of um, material living conditions right. and its impact for um, uh, the experience of freedom. Mm -hmm. in Europe, through Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, or someone mentioned, even you were, were not the one, I, I, I forgot who it was, uh, that uh, the gentleman there, um, that uh, 
the great attraction of Europe is uh, that uh, you get uh, the authoritarian inclinations of your uh, national government of your back. And uh, Europe can be experienced as a libera mm -hmm. liberating agency. Uh, and uh, many people in Poland right. and uh, uh, Hungary and Slovakia and Czech Republic and other places uh, may hope for that. Uh, they should stop our gap. And, and uh, I mean, the trust in you, there's one country, as I know from uh, Ivan Kastev, uh, where uh, the European Union is more popular than the national government, mm -hmm. and that is Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. They hate that or distrust their mm -hmm. government so much that it's the thing. It can only be for the better if Europe right. takes over. Right. But uh, that applies to the socioeconomic uh, uh, level as well. Let me just mention three uh, little perspectives, not mm -hmm. so little. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the Europeanization of unemployment insurance. 50% of okay. all unemployment payments uh, are out of European funds, and the, mm. uh, the, this is the basis, and they are topped up by national regulation. Right? Uh, simple idea calculated in detail by the uh, previous mm -hmm. uh, 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 commissioner for labor markets, uh, Laszlo Andor, mm -hmm. and uh, you can put it, take it out of the drawer, and uh, uh, yeah involve transfers across national borders. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And people mm -hmm. who are afraid that much afraid of mm -hmm. their own voters, mm -hmm. like the German Chancellor, uh, uh, would not come close to it. But maybe if uh, Macron uh, comes close to it. Another is harmonization of corporate taxes, mm -hmm. which are 58% in Denmark and 10% flat rate in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. Uh, the third example is uh, uh, an investment fund managed by the uh, European finance minister and on the basis of a European budget uh, mm -hmm. uh, approved by the European Parliament. These are unifying measures which are experienced as such by European mm -hmm. citizens and maybe help more to solve the problem mm -hmm. than all kinds of European uh, light switches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Miriam, would you like to add something? Okay, okay. So, thank you so much, yeah, thank yeah, you. Uh, Alexander, dear Klaus, and thank uh, the institute uh, that we had the chance to present here to share with you um, the uh, the work on Birkenförde. And um, Klaus mentioned that um, Miriam and I would know everything about Birkenförde. No, with every book presentation we had, we <laughs> realized that there is so much new to learn about him, mm -hmm. and we uh, took a lot of um, insights here. And um, now, thanks to the um, the um, to, to the <coughs> institute, I, I, when I got this correct, we can go yeah to the first floor to um, no, the downstairs, downstairs, downstairs to proceed yes. our discussions with yeah. a glass of wine and to talk about universalism, uh, etc. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. thank yeah, you all. Yeah, to, to address the yeah, we yeah. can talk now. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.